Hello and welcome to this one hour webinar on pandemic distress, navigating the course with social emotional learning. My name is Donna Black and I'm an assessment consultant with WPS. I'll be your navigator and guide as we explore this very timely topic. For several weeks now, we've been witnessing the devastation caused by the coronavirus and it has changed our world in ways that we could never have imagined just a few short weeks ago. The impact on our lives, on the economy, and on the healthcare has been unimaginable. But the long-term impact on the social and emotional development of our young people is something that we're just beginning to see unfold. Whatever that negative impact might be, what we do right now and in the coming months can help these young people navigate through this crisis in a way that can help them have a healthy recovery, but also to unlock their unique potential. We at WPS believe that every single child has potential and we're committed to helping educators unlock that potential. That's why we're proud to present this first Unlocking Potential webinar. Let's get started. Our objectives for this one hour webinar are to help identify ways in which social emotional learning can help mitigate the potential negative impact of this crisis on our youngsters and to create positive learning opportunities for these students while they're staying at home and learning through distance learning and virtual environments. The second objective is to increase our understanding of how adverse childhood experiences, such as the COVID-19 pandemic, can impact brain development and learning. And then our third objective is to describe some strategies for how we might promote social-emotional development in students during these times of social distancing. Before we begin discussing SEL and its relationship to the brain and learning, I'd really like to focus on the topic in the context of what we're currently experiencing. As I said before, we're living in uncertain times and there's so much that's unknown and so many questions that are unanswered that this uncertainty has led to heightened levels of anxiety. And this can further exacerbate the distress that we might be experiencing as a result. How we as adults manage and cope with this distress can dramatically influence how young people will be impacted by this event. While no one has all the answers or knows what the future holds in store, we have plenty of resources and supports that can help us get through this, especially as we're working with these young people to help mitigate some of these negative effects that this might have on their lives. Social emotional learning is one of the most valuable supports that we can offer to our students during this time. Not only can it influence their learning experience while they're being schooled virtually, but it also can help them learn to manage and cope with the day-to-day -day stressors that life tends to bring. Essentially, social-emotional learning can help promote more positive outcomes for our students. So let's begin by defining what SEL is. Dr. Maurice Elias, the director of the Rutgers University Social-Emotional Learning Lab, defines SEL as a process. In his definition, he says it is the process through which young people develop an ability to recognize and manage their own emotions and also learn to care and have concern for other people. It's also a process for learning how to make good decisions, how to behave ethically and responsibly and avoid risk-taking behaviors, and how to have lasting and positive relationships. But the emphasis in his definition is clearly on the process and learning is the vehicle. Now, typically in a school environment, when we begin the implementation process for SEL, we focus on school culture and climate because that lays the foundation for a positive learning environment. 
Since we're not in school, however, this process can certainly be adapted to the current circumstances. Because as we look at this definition, I can't help but think that the reality of our circumstances is forcing us to now bring SEL to the forefront. The crisis that we're experiencing demands these very skills. And through our adapted learning environments and using technology, we have an opportunity to begin infusing these skills into that learning process as we're teaching these youngsters through this virtual environment. You might be asking why this is so important. Well, what we know about environmental exposure and experiences is that they have a significant impact on brain development and as a result on learning. And it's not always in positive ways. So let's look at the role that SEL can play in negating these negative outcomes. Environmental factors influence and shape the brain. This we know through the numerous scientific studies conducted on the brain. The emotional environment in particular plays a central role in shaping the circuits of the brain, especially when children are young. And it, these brain patterns that are established can persist throughout their adult, uh, entire adult lifespan. Social and emotional learning can play a very central role in changing how this brain is structured and can, as I said earlier, mitigate the negative consequences of these negative environmental experiences on the brain. So social emotional learning can lead to more positive changes in how the brain is structured, which in turn can lead to improved fun functioning both emotionally and cognitively. So let's look at how SEL impacts brain functioning and how it is structured. As I said, SEL is the vehicle through which positive brain changes can occur. It is a process. It's not really a program and it's not a curriculum. This process leads to overall improvement in how youngsters develop working memory, academic performance, and emotion regulation. And as I've already said, environmental influences can impact that brain structure and that functioning. But what we do know that's positive is that neuroscience has confirmed that the brain is malleable. It can be shaped. And we'll be chatting about that in just a moment. You may have heard some terms, though, like fixed, fixed mindset or growth mindset. And these terms have evolved from the neuroscientific studies on the brain. And what these terms tell us is that the brain structure and function that we previously thought was fixed for life, we now know can change throughout the lifespan. But it is highly influenced by environmental experiences. That's why it's so important for us to begin the process of teaching social and emotional learning skills. SEL offers a unique opportunity to improve this brain's functioning which can lead to improvements not only in learning, but in, but in lifelong abilities to cope and manage with the life stresses that we encounter. So let's take a close look at how the brain responds to environmental influences and how SEL can improve adaptive functioning. In this graphic, you see a picture of the brain. The parts of the brain where emotion is manifested is called the limbic system. Within this interconnected limbic system are a set of nodes that generate emotions and then distribute information about those emotions when we experience them. One very important part of the limbic system is the amygdala. This part of the brain is responsible for many of our emotions and even our motivation. Primarily, it's responsible for our responses to fear, anxiety, and anger, but it's also responsible to our responses to pleasure. 
Then there's this other part of the brain called the prefrontal cortex. That's the part of the brain that regulates these emotions. So it allows us to take perspective or to think or to analyze and how to use our language. When we experience any of the emotions from the amygdala, for example, like when we become distressed or frazzled, we lose this ability to think. So what happens is the amygdala essentially hijacks the prefrontal cortex and, he holds, and it holds it hostage. So we're virtually held hostage and unable to learn and become cognitively dysfunctional. So when that happens, when these emotions start churning, and when children are experiencing heightened levels of emotion, they cannot learn. So when their emotions are churning, they can't be learning. Research on the brain has taught us that these parts of the brain that help us understand emotions is just as important, if not more important, to the process of learning as the parts of the brain that help us understand reading, writing, and math. When we're stressed or frazzled, individuals become disengaged from that learning process because the brain's prefrontal lobe has become disabled. This prefrontal lobe is the part of the brain, remember, that controls comprehension, focus, learning, and creativity. So as you see in the, dra in the graphic on the screen there, students, when students develop these social and emotional abilities, they learn to manage and cope with the environmental threats, which then leads to lowered levels of anxiety, and that leads to improved brain functioning especially in the area of the prefrontal cortex where emotion regulation and working memory are. And these two things play a very big part in academic performance. Now that we've looked briefly at the brain and the impact of the brain on learning, let's turn our attention to what we know about adverse childhood experiences are also known as ACEs. So we're gonna focus on these ACEs in the context again of COVID-19 and how that may be impacting the, the brain's functioning at, and learning. It's important to note that individuals will respond differently to this event. It is the perception and their physiological reaction and their psychological reaction to the event that will determine if the experience is a traumatic experience or a toxic experience. Not all students will experience the same degree of distress because there are various factors that influence each person's experience. And that's true for this pandemic crisis as well. There are many variables that can influence the impact. Among them are things like the home environment, uh, when youngsters are in an environment that is stable and supportive, both emotionally and physically, and if those students have access to the resources, the technology, and the adult support they may need, then the harmful effects of this crisis may not be as traumatizing. But when these factors are not present and not available, and to many students they are not, then there is a higher risk that the crisis will be much more traumatizing. We're gonna spend the next several minutes examining some of these factors to increase our understanding of how ACEs can impact learning and to look at how SEL can be employed as a tool for mitigating the effects of these ACEs on our students' learning. So ACEs are defined as events that are experienced or witnessed in childhood that are potentially traumatic. These events are extreme adversities that are experienced in childhood. This includes experiences of abuse, neglect, or violence, and includes the aspects of a child's environment that can undermine their sense of safety, stability, and bonding. 
So let's look more closely at those. There are various types of adversities. These might include abuse, both or all types of abuse. Abuse, maybe it might be physical abuse, emotional abuse, or even sexual abuse. It also includes neglect, and it could include environmental conditions. There are three categories of environmental conditions. There are home conditions, there are society, community conditions, and then there are some other conditions. Some of the types of adversities that are present in the home might be things like poverty, domestic violence, caregiver mental, mental illness, incarceration of a parent or a caregiver, substance abuse by a caregiver, the death of a family member or a loved one, parental divorce and separation, and if the caregiver is in the military and the family is experiencing the related stresses of that. Some of the conditions in society or within the community would, might include violence, racism and xenophobic hate and, and bias, bullying, peer rejection, terrorism, and even war. And then the other types of adversity, adversities might include natural disasters, serious accidents, life-threatening illnesses, and even a disability. As we know, many of the youngsters we work with have disabilities. And for these youngsters, there is an increased likelihood that they will be experiencing more trauma as a result of this crisis. All of these types of adversities represent a range of traumatic events that can have a harmful impact on a child's physical development and their mental health all the way into adulthood. They can impact our students' day-to-day -day functioning and their ability to learn. So it's very important as educators for us to have a clear understanding of how these adversities lead to stressors that impact our children. And the more adversities they experience, the greater the impact. That's why it's very important for us to be well informed of trauma, trauma informed teaching practices to help us recognize emotional and behavioral reactions to certain environmental stimuli. This can help to prevent the unintentional triggering of past negative events, which can then help to de-escalate any emotional behavioral reactions that these youngsters might have. Sometimes these reactions are internal reactions that aren't often noticeable, but in many cases, they're external reactions. So it just stands to reason that not all traumatic events are the same. They're not all created equally. And so they aren't going to have the same kind of impact. But most traumatic events can be categorized as either of type 1 or type 2. Type 1 events are discrete events. They're single events that occur that are, could be a life-threatening experience or a life-threatening event. But they are traumatic events that occur only once but they can re result in symptoms associated with post-traumatic stress disorder because of the severity of them. The other type, type two, are those adverse conditions that are more chronic, and they tend, these are conditions that tend to be repeated over time, such as being the victim of abuse or maltreatment. Now, type two traumas are also known as complex traumas because they're more severe and they're more pervasive. Most of the time they begin early in life and because of that can disrupt a lot of the aspects of child development and self formation. So when thinking about the long term impact of the current health crisis on our students, it's clear that those with type two trauma experiences are going to be the most vulnerable to the negative impacts of this current crisis. In fact, many experts are predicting an increase in negative behaviors and emotional functioning for many of these students when they return to this normal school routine and normal school environment. That's another argument for promoting 
SEL skill development right now to help mitigate the impact of this crisis on these students. So in other words, what educators and parents do right now can impact coming months. What can we do to help mitigate some of the negative impacts of this crisis and improve their ability to cope? Well, let's take a look. First and foremost is the need to ensure their safety. And it stands to reason that physical safety is at the forefront during these times. And students should be instructed in the importance of keeping themselves safe. Uh, teachers can facilitate this lesson, can help parents learn some proper safety techniques, especially for younger children, and help parents deliver some of those lessons. Uh, many of our young children who are in our early childhood programs or in our early elementary years, for example, may not understand the importance of proper hand washing may not understand how germs are spread. So teachers can develop lessons to help facilitate the teaching of this. For example, uh, perhaps the use of glitter could help young children to understand that when it sticks to your hands and you touch other surfaces, it leaves the glitter on those surfaces. And this can help them to understand how germs are spread. And another thing that teachers can help facilitate for parents is the importance of wearing a face mask if they need, should they have to leave their home. Now, while there are a lot of concerns for physical safety right now, it's, it's only natural to prioritize that safety, ensuring their psychological safety is of equal importance because these students, especially if these students have a history of complex trauma, to be clear, it's important to ensure everyone's psychological safety, but for children with a history of trauma, this process can go a long way in helping to mitigate the compounding effects from having experienced multiple traumatic events. So talking with students about the crisis event can become very important. If we don't talk to them, if we don't make the event seem, it can make the event seem more threatening, especially in a young child's mind, because not talking can inadvertently send the message that the event is just too horrible to talk about. So talking becomes a very important intervention. But when talking with our students about the event, it's important that we, that we be honest and open and use developmentally appropriate language. Adults should begin the discussion by finding out first what the student has heard and what his or her understanding might be. Then spend time clarifying and explaining in simple terms and as directly as possible any facts related to the event. Questions should be answered with as only a limited amount of detail, especially well, I should say the question should be answered in the amount of detail that is appropriate for their age. So younger children will not need as much detail as older children might. But every student will be different, so adults should take their cues from the student. And then parents should also be encouraged to limit their children's television viewing. And this is especially important for younger children. Older children or older students, parents may want to view the television reports with them and then use that opportunity to discuss their feelings and their thoughts. At all costs, though, we should refrain from forcing students to discuss the event, but we should be ready to talk with them when they're ready and take the cue from the student. They're going to let us know when they want to talk. Um, just to summarize, it's in, you know, understanding the impact of these adverse childhood experiences can really help us get some meaningful insight into how a child adapts to their world, and this can better inform our intervention efforts. So that brings us now to a discussion about SEL and why it has taken such a prominent focus during this crisis. As we said earlier, life as we know it has been interrupted by COVID-19. 
Now, unlike our school holidays and our projected weather days, we didn't anticipate this disturbance to our school year, so we definitely were not prepared for it. We're now wondering if things will ever return to normal again. And this crisis will likely have rippling effects across our lives. And much of that rippling effect is still unknown. What we can anticipate is that our students will be wondering the same things that we are. Questions such as, will our school look the same? Will our friends be back? Will we have to repeat the coursework? Will there be more work to do? Will we be able to move on and learn the next level of our work, our schoolwork? How will school adapt to all of this? And what will that look like? Many youngsters will be wondering if the state assessment is still going to be required. That's a natural concern. Well, while things may seem really scary as we return, they're not hopeless. And while we can expect things to return to some sense of normalcy, we should not expect things to be the same as they were before this pandemic. What we can be prepared for is a new norm. The impact of the crisis and the adverse effects of the accompanying social isolation will make the need for social and emotional competencies more prevalent than ever before. And now is the time to prepare for this need. Social and emotional competencies will be essential, not only in helping us navigate through the current emotions and fears and anxieties we might have, but also in preparing for the unknowns of the coming days, months, and maybe even years. So let's take a closer look at what will be needed. There are currently more than 40 different SEL frameworks. Each of these was developed to help organize and describe social and emotional skills. These are sometimes referred to as non-academic skills or soft skills. There are different names and different terms often being used to refer to the same skills. And this is what makes it confusing to educators, parents, and policymakers. But the important thing for us to remember is that, again, SEL is not a program. As we said earlier, it's a process. And this process helps us teach these skills that the young people will need in order for them to be successful in school and later in life. What we know is that the most widely adopted framework in schools is the CASEL framework. It was developed by the Collaborative for Academic, Social, and Emotional learning, which is a nonprofit organization. And the CASEL framework has identified five core competencies that youngsters will need. Let's take a look. Self-awareness is the ability to accurately recognize one's emotions, their thoughts, and how these influence their behavior. Self-management is the ability to regulate emotions, thoughts, and behaviors in different situations. Social awareness is the ability to take the perspective of another and empathize with others from diverse backgrounds and cultures. And to understand the social and ethical norms for behavior and to recognize family, school, and community resources and supports. Now relationship skills is the ability to establish and maintain healthy and rewarding relationships with diverse individuals and groups. And lastly, our responsible decision-making skills. This is the ability to make constructive and respectful choices about our own personal behavior and our social interactions. And it's based on a consideration of the ethical standards, any safety concerns, the social norms, and the real, realistic evaluation of the consequences of our actions. Not only the consequences for us, but the consequences for others as well. So how can teachers infuse SEL into the virtual school world or the school environment? During this distance learning, there are some different approaches that could be employed. So we're gonna explore some of those 
possibilities. First, I think it's important for us to recognize that SEL isn't just a 20 minute lesson. It is so much more than that. It's an approach, again, to teaching in which the development of these social and emotional competencies is purposefully infused into every single lesson. And then it is reinforced through interesting and engaging interactions and activities. So how can teachers facilitate this process while their students are not under their tutelage? They're really at home sheltering in place. One of the best ways is to collaborate with parents to identify opportunities in which some of these skills could be modeled and reinforced in the home environment and through the, the learning process. So let's look at some suggestions to how we might approach this. To begin with, we're gonna look at teaching self-awareness. Now this begins by encouraging children to talk about their thoughts and their feelings and their emotions. And especially during these trying times, as we said earlier, it's very important that we talk about them. And this can be done through our planned lessons but it also can be done by parents during their daily interactions with the children. Uh, typical things that we do during the day, such as sitting down and having a meal together, parents could open up a conversation about how they might be feeling and expressing those emotions and learning to expressing those emotions in a positive or in a, a open way. Because as adults listen to their children and they can reassure them that their fears and worries are natural, that everybody is feeling a certain degree of anxiety and a certain degree of concern right now, and these are natural feelings, but children need to know that the adults in their world are doing everything they can to help keep them and others safe. Part of teaching self-awareness is teaching self-confidence because self-confidence is a recognition of your own strengths and the role that they play in your behavior. So helping children express their own strengths and then expressing confidence in those strengths when they're able to seek help and find answers and when they're able to alert adults when they need assistance, those are all times when we can express confidence in their ability to take care of themselves. And praising youngsters when they apply these strengths can teach self-confidence as well. Self-awareness also involves the development of self-efficacy. By helping children feel a sense of control over their own circumstances, they can better develop an understanding of the ability that they have to influence what happens to them. Explaining to them that while things may seem pretty frightening right now, there are certain things that they can do to keep themselves and others safe. Again, this is an excellent opportunity to talk about the importance of having good hygiene and the importance of eating healthy, maintaining plenty of rest, getting enough sleep at night, and um, just taking good care of themselves. Some approaches for teaching self-management are also um, discussed here. These skills can be taught by adults simply by modeling their own emotional control and managing their, only their own daily stresses. I know this is a very difficult time for adults as well, uh, but as we manage our own daily stresses and, and control our own emotions, this is a, an excellent way of modeling for young children, how to, how, what self-management looks like. One of the most important aspects of self-management is impulse control. Mm -hmm. Talking to children about what this means in terms of thinking before they act, is a, there's a great opportunity for teaching this impulse control. I think during this current crisis, we've seen some observations. I've observed people who acted impulsively as a result of their frustration, and this can be an important thing to point out to our young people here. 
uh, identify to, with them how this frustration has led some people to overact. In, in other words, we've seen people rushing to the stores to buy out supplies for fear that they would not be able to access them. And some of those medical supplies that were necessary for the healthcare workers were, were needing to be replenished because of that. So that could be an excellent example to share with them. And you might come up with other examples as well that talk about how frustration can impact our impulse control, our ability to control those impulses. Another key component of self-management is stress management. Um, discussing the, how the health crisis has led to so many changes for people and how those changes have resulted in stressful situations can be an excellent example to share with our young people here. Some of our older students are beginning to experience a great deal of stress with regard to their ability to complete their courses, especially if they're graduating this year. And this can affect, and they're concerned about how this might affect their ability to attend college in the fall. So this could be another excellent example of how we can learn to manage stresses. And I think through introducing youngsters to some stress management techniques, this will help them learn to cope and manage these stresses. Things like mindfulness and relaxation strategies there, there are a number of yoga apps available and a number of mindfulness apps available. So those could be some strategies to introduce them to as they're learning to manage some of these stressors. Another important component of self-management is goal setting. Youngsters learn to manage better when they have the ability to set and achieve goals. This is another opportunity for parents and teachers to introduce goal setting. Right now, the, one of the most important things parents can do is to set and keep a normal routine in the home. And through that routine, setting up that routine, they can help students learn to identify and set weekly goals. And then these weekly goals can be broken into a set of daily goals with several shorter goals that could be easily achieved. The important thing is to make sure that they can be achieved so that youngsters learn goal setting. The, the object is not to achieve the goals. The object is to learn how to set the goals so that they learn how to manage their own lives. Another component of self-management is organizational skills. You know, many communities have reduced access to services and supplies right now because of social distancing. So this could be an excellent opportunity to teach youngsters preparedness by using organizational skills. Um, so many families have had to be, to be prepared for long periods of stay in, at home. And enlisting your children and your, the students in this process can be very helpful in teaching organizational skills. I've heard that some parents have turned it into a fun activity, like an adventure. Um, perhaps they're going on a staycation. And so through this staycation, they help their, the children can help them learn to organize some activities for the staycation and to determine what supplies might be needed. So integrating planning and organizational activities into our daily plans can help teach these much needed skills. The next category, the next competency we're going to look at is social awareness. This can be taught by adults again through modeling of empathy and perspective taking. When opportunities are presented, it's important to discuss with your children the importance of practicing this in everyday life. A key skill in developing social awareness is learning how to empathize. That could be done by acknowledging and discussing how others might have been impacted by this health crisis, and then talk about how that might feel for other families or for other individuals. Helping children learn to put themselves into another person's situation can help to teach empathy. 
And then talk about ways in which your family might be able to help these others in need or how they themselves might be able to help. Another key component of social awareness is teaching perspective taking, appreciating diversity and respecting others. This can be taught by identifying and discussing how other children and families may have responded differently to this health crisis. Talk about how some groups and some families have different beliefs. And while these may sometimes seem odd or different and strange to us, it doesn't mean they are wrong. Spend time talking with them or discussing with your young people that we are more alike than we are different. You know, we just had an opportunity to really talk about these differences as um, people within the United States just went through the holiday of the Easter holiday and Passover holiday. And that was an excellent opportunity to talk with our youngsters about the different perspectives on religion and how that has impacted um, the lives as a result of the crisis here. So now let's look at relationship skills and how we can teach those. By demonstrating and discussing ways to improve our communications and how we can learn to listen and cooperate with one another, we can help young people develop the skills they need to, have, to build relationships that are lasting. Now, right now during this health crisis, there is a big chance that students being confined at home have a lot of extra time on their hands and are becoming bored or agitated. If there happen to be siblings or other children in the home, there's an added chance that there are disagreements and conflicts. So this presents us with an excellent opportunity for our parents to model, teach, and reinforce relationship building skills. Because communication plays such a critical role in this process, we can teach youngsters how to best communicate their thoughts, feelings, and needs in a non-emotional manner. By teaching them to listen to what others are saying and then ask clarification statements to reflect on what they heard. Things like, I heard you say, and then repeating and, and rephrasing what they heard them say. It's also important to discuss how body language and nonverbal expressions can communicate very different messages than their words. And lastly, helping them learn how to use I statements instead of you statements is a critical skill. And, and most adults could benefit from that skill as well. Another key component of teaching relationship skills is cooperation and negotiation. So when these sibling con uh, conflicts occur in the home, it, it's, very, it's not only natural for parents to want to intervene in these conflicts, but the best thing that parents can do is to refrain from jumping in with a solution. Although parents are also dealing with heightened levels of distress themselves, and this can be a very challenging thing to do, it's very important that parents deal with their own, immerse, their own emotions first, then take the time to listen to their children and encourage them to use their communication skills that we just talked about to help to resolve some of these, process, these problems and conflicts. Explaining to them that negative emotions are natural when we're having problems and conflict but it is important to learn how to cope with these, these emotions because things may not always go the way we want them to go. So learning to experience and cope with the conflict and with failure is a very important factor in developing character. And that brings us to responsible decision making. This involves teaching students how to make constructive choices, especially during this health crisis. As we said earlier, safety is a priority, but this crisis offers us, offers us an opportunity to teach some problem-solving strategies 
And this can reinforce our children's ability to make appropriate decisions for their own safety. By teaching them problem solving steps, we can help them learn how to weigh the risks and benefits of their decisions and how those decisions might impact themselves and others. So the strategies, it's a four step strategy and that involves teaching, first of all, the problem, identifying what that problem is, helping them to identify what the real problem is, then analyzing the situation. Third, it involves identifying a, a potential solution, but it might be multiple solutions. But the fourth step is to look at each solution and the consequence of, the, of those solutions and then determining which solution is best. Oops, we went too far here. So, we began this webinar with a discussion about the long-term impact of the crisis and we projected that the need for SEL will be greater than ever before. So this next section is gonna focus on how we can sustain our interest in and advocate for SEL as schools reopen. Most local and state departments of education will likely make academic development a top priority when we return. And while this is critical and necessary, it cannot compare to the social, emotional, and behavioral needs that our students and staff will need. It's very likely that we will be facing another type of crisis as schools reopen. The need for SEL will be unprecedented. How our schools will address these needs is the question. Now, here are a set of questions that we'll, we will need to start addressing as schools begin to prepare this process of returning students and staff to school. Now, I just want to clarify that these questions can't wait until the crisis is over. Schools need to begin asking these questions now and should be using them to guide their plans for the reopening and return to school. While students and staff will be going back to school, it's important to understand that they will be going back to life. They will not be going back to life as they knew it. Things will have changed and needs will be different. One of the most urgent needs will be social and emotional learning. So what are some of the issues that will need to be addressed as we begin preparing for this return? First, school leaders need to identify their students' skill levels in terms of SEL competencies. So they will need to assess these skills. And there are several SEL assessment tools available and I'm gonna be discussing those next. Then they will need to determine if SEL instructional strategies or programs that they might be using are aligned with these identified skills. In other words, if we're measuring it, we need to teach what we're measuring. And we need to make sure that the programs and strategies that we're using are teaching what we measured. Uh, some of the skills we talked about can be interpreted and perceived differently. As I said earlier, there are many terms to use that have been used to describe these skills. And so we have to be very clear about what it is we're measuring and what we're teaching. School leaders also will need to address the school processes that will need to be in place. Things like school culture and climate will help to lay the foundation for a sustainable approach to SEL. In addition, these school leaders will need to identify how their data will be collected and how it will be used to inform their ongoing decisions. These are just some of the issues that will need to be addressed. A comprehensive approach to implementing SEL is far more complex than what we can address in this webinar, but these questions can offer a starting point. Okay, before we dive into a discussion on assessing SEL skills, let's do a quick overview of the different ways in which skills can be measured. 
Rating scales allow a rater to assign a value to an attribute, such as an SEL competency, and there are typically three types. Self-report measures are completed by students. Teacher, teacher ratings are completed by teachers, and of course the parent caregiver rating is completed by a parent or caregiver. Direct measures allow us to measure skills directly instead of relying upon a rater's observations or opinions. And then lastly, we have observations. These can be structured, semi-structured, or unstructured. And typically they are based on observations of behavior when we're looking at assessing SEL skills. So now that we've looked at the methods for assessing skills, let's look at the types of assessments that we might use. I'd like to begin with a discussion on standardized tests. These are tests that are administered and scored in a predetermined standard manner. These forms of tests require all test takers to complete the test according to a set of standards. So in other words, test takers must answer the same questions or the set of questions in the same way or the same format. And then the test is scored in a standard or consistent manner. Standardized tests makes it possible for us to be able to compare an individual's performance to other individuals or groups of students to other groups of students. And it helps us to inform our instruction. So as you can see from the list, there are many types of assessments. But we're going to focus on the standardized assessments, which are highlighted in red. Those are the criterion referenced assessments and norm referenced assessments. Criterion referenced assessments allow us to measure the performance of an individual against a predetermined criteria or a learning standard such as what we do when we measure students' academic performance with our state assessment tests. Norm reference tests allow us to compare a student's performance against other students' performance. So there's a, nat a national or norm group to which we can pay compare a student's performance. In order to determine how suitable a test or instrument is for use in measuring our SEL skills, there are three things we should be considering, and those are considered the technical properties of, an, of a measure or a test. An, an assessment tool can be deemed suitable if it conforms to these three technical properties. The first of these is reliability that tells us how useful that instrument's going to be. Because it gives us an idea as to whether or not the instrument is measuring what we want it to measure in a consistent way. So the question to ask is, does it give the same or similar score each time it's administered? Is it consistently useful to us? For example, if I wanted to measure the length of something and I used a wooden ruler, would that ruler give me consistent results each time that I used it? Of course, depending on the quality of the ruler, it should. Then the next property we should be looking at is the validity of the instrument. And that simply is asking the question, does it measure what we want it to measure? Is it, design, is it measuring what it's designed to measure, in other words? And then lastly, we should ask ourselves, does the measure or the instrument measure what it's intended to measure equally and in an unbiased fashion for all groups of students? The measure should be reliable and it should be valid for all groups of students. Now that we've looked at the types and methods of assessment, I wanted to introduce you to three tools that WPS offers that can be helpful in measuring and progress monitoring social and emotional skills when these students return to school. The first instrument I want to talk with you about is called the Risk Inventory and Strengths Assessment. 
The acronym for that is the RISE, and that instrument was developed by Dr. Sam Goldstein and Dr. David Herzberg. The instrument is designed to look at both risky behaviors and psychological strengths. This is the first tool of its kind to actually look at these two context, concepts within the context of each other. So it allows you to measure a child's degree of risk in terms of their behavior uh, compared to what psychological strengths that they might have because the psychological strengths can mitigate some of those risky behaviors and this instrument will be able to tell you how, how many risky behaviors the youngster might be engaging in and then look at what psychological strengths the, the youngster might have to help mitigate some of those risky behaviors. It's designed for ages nine through 25 years, and there is a parent rating, a teacher rating, and a self-report for the student. It takes about 15 to 20 minutes to administer it. So this instrument would typically be used at tier two or tier three for youngsters who are identified as at risk. And it gives you norm referenced T-scores looking at these two broad constructs of risk and strength. So it does allow you to look at their performance compared to other youngsters of the same age. Next we have the BIMAS-2, which is uh, the Behavior Intervention Monitoring Assessment System. The authors are listed on the screen there. And the purpose of this instrument is not only to conduct universal screenings, and identify youngsters with behavioral, emotional, social, emotional issues, but also to conduct progress monitoring with those youngsters. It's designed for ages 5 to 18. There are four rating scales. One of those is for parents, one for teachers, and then there is a self-report for the older children, ages 12 to 18. And in addition to that, it offers a clinician's report for youngsters who might be being seen by a a therapist or an outside clinician. It can be administered via the internet. It's a web-based or it's paper and pencil as well. It takes about five to ten minutes for each student and it's available in multiple languages including English and Spanish. And lastly, the one I'm most excited to talk with you about is um, a new measure that's about to be published. It's the Social Emotional Learning Skills Inventory, and it's a screener. It was developed by Dr. Thomas Shanding, and this screener is a standardized norm-referenced rating scale. Uh, one, of the, one of the only that I'm aware of that's out there that's actually norm-referenced. It is designed to measure the five core competencies identified by CASEL and it can be completed by either teachers or parents. It's very useful for tier one interventions and, and identification of youngsters, um, social emotional skills at tier one of the MTSS process because it can help guide areas of instruction that are most needed. It only takes about one minute to administer for each student. And as I said, the publication date, it's coming soon. We don't have an identified or set date, but we do anticipate it coming out by the end of this year. If you happen to be interested in want more information about the CELSI screener, we are actually looking for schools or school districts to pilot the screener in their school. So if you'd like to contact us because you're interested in this, you can reach us at consult at wpspublish.com. If you are chosen as a pilot school or a pilot district, you would receive the materials at no cost and you would be trained on the proper administration of the instrument. Also, if you have questions or if you have comments about today's webinar, please contact us or reach out to us at consult at wpspublish.com. There are five assessment consultants at WPS and each of us are ready and willing to, to help you in whatever way we might be able to. We hope that you have enjoyed this webinar and we thank you for joining us. We look forward to hearing from you.